Today we uh, continue our series in the 12 strong men uh, versus the finished work of Christ and we're looking at the lying spirit and before we uh, open the word I'd like us to bow our heads. Father God we just thank you and praise you that you are truth, uh, that you are the personification of truth and that uh, the devil is a liar and we just pray Lord that as we get to know you better and better we will be able to identify the devil's lies very easily and not partner with them in our lives. So we just pray you'll bless us today and that your spirit will speak to each one just according to what we need today because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of an intellectual academic who married a young atheist who he thought was very much like himself until uh, after they got married and she ended up getting converted before they even had any kids. And he was very upset about this and uh, told her that he wanted to raise the children as atheists. But of course she didn't agree to that and it was kind of a source of conflict for them year after year. But when their oldest child got to the age of six, six she came to her dad and, and she said, Daddy, where did people come from? How did people begin on the earth? And so he launched into quite a description of evolution and how human beings came up from the lowest life forms and how we ultimately descended from the monkeys and the apes. And uh, when he finished, she said, but daddy, m mommy said that God spoke and human beings were created. And uh, her father just shook his head and he said, don't believe those fairy tale lies, honey. Uh, learn to think for yourself. So she went back and she told her mom what dad had said and her mom put her arm around her and she said, they're not lies, honey. Daddy's just telling you where his family came from and I'm telling you about mine. <laughs> I guess you can say that lying is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. But uh, the Bible tells us that uh, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. We read that over in Proverbs 12, 22. And it tells us that liars will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but they will be thrown into the lake of fire and die the second death over in Revelation 21, 8. Moreover, um, we find that lying takes many different shapes and forms uh, in people's minds. There are really very few human beings who are radically honest in every single thing that they say. And most people, including most Christians, don't consider white lies to necessarily even be sin. But Jesus said over in Luke 16, 10, he who is dishonest in little will be dishonest in much. I don't particularly like that text, but uh, it's in the book. And today we're looking at this ninth strong man called the lying spirit. And as we look at the lying spirit, um, we want to start over in 2 Chronicles 18.22. This is the first time this spirit is mentioned in the Bible. And if you know this story, you know that King Ahab uh, was wanting to take Israel into war, but he wanted uh, King Jehoshaphat and Judah to come with him. So he approaches King Jehoshaphat, tells, hey, we're brothers, let's go into this fight together. And Jehoshaphat says, well, not without inquiring of the Lord. That was the difference between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Jehoshaphat always wanted to inquire of the Lord, and Ahab didn't. So Ahab says, okay, and he drags in his 400 prophets, and, and they all say, yes, go, go together, go fight, you'll be victorious. And uh, Jehoshaphat is not impressed with these yes men. And he says to King Ahab, don't you have any prophet who actually hears from the Lord? You know, he's, he's basically ridiculing these uh, 400 prophets that showed up. And Ahab says, well, yes, there is one, Micaiah, but I hate him. I, I love the way he puts this. I hate him because he never tells me what I want to hear. <laughs> so 
uh, so they call for Micaiah and bring him in and the other prophets get to him and tell him, you know, this is, this is the word. You need to go along with it. But uh, Micaiah says, I can only say what the Lord puts in my mouth. But to everyone's surprise, when he gets into the king's presence, he gives the same prophecy. He says, yes, go up and you will be victorious. And Ahab can't even believe this. He confronts him and he says, I want you to tell the truth. Oh, the truth, says Micaiah. Okay, the truth is, if you go into battle, you will lose and you will not return. You will be killed. And uh, Ahab quickly points to Jehoshaphat and he says, see, I told you, this guy never says anything good. And so uh, one of his henchmen starts beating the prophet and uh, Ahab says, go throw him in prison until I get back. And as they're dragging him away, Micaiah says, if you come back, I'm a false prophet. You're, you're not coming back. And, uh, you know, sure enough, the next day Ahab goes into battle. He disguises himself. He completely defies what the true prophet said and uh, thinks that he'll be okay because the enemy won't recognize him as the king. But lo and behold, a random arrow that's just shot in the air comes down, penetrates the crease in his armor, and kills the king. And of course, they're defeated, just as Micaiah said they would be. Now, this is a pretty strange uh, story when you look at it. And I think the strangest thing about it is in this verse, 2 Chronicles 18, 22, where Micaiah, after he tells the truth, says, well, the reason for all the lies is that the Lord put a lying spirit in the prophet's mouth, mouths. That's pretty interesting. The Lord put a lying spirit in the prophet's mouths. <laughs> we don't usually think of the Lord as partnering up with lying spirits or much less putting them in the mouths of prophets. But that's what this verse says. And like the story of Job, we see here that God even uses the devil and his minions to accomplish his greater kingdom purposes when that's part of his plan. There are three other points that I want to make from this story this morning that have to do with a lying spirit. The first point is the lying spirit is a people-pleasing spirit that is the total opposite of the spirit of jealousy and control. The last strongman that we looked at was the spirit of jealousy, which majors in control, power, offense, as well as divide and conquer. That's how this spirit works. And this spirit is personified through Queen Jezebel. That's why it's often referred to as the Jezebel spirit, because she basically personifies this spirit perfectly. Now, in our story today, we see that there are 400 prophets that belong to Ahab and Jezebel. That's what I say, belong, because they always tell this royal couple exactly what they want to hear. That's all they're good for. They're uh, what we would call people pleasers, especially the right people, the top people. And they function totally and completely under a lying spirit. The more we concentrate on being people pleasers as human beings, the more we will be troubled by a lying spirit. These two things go together. Being a people pleaser and having a lying spirit are really one and the same to a great degree. There's a text over in John 12, 43, where it talks about Jews who wanted to follow Jesus, but it says they failed to do so for fear of the Jewish leaders. And the text goes on to say, they loved the approval of men more than the approval of God. They were people pleasers. So they believed the devil's lie that being liked and accepted is more important than doing God's will. As I mentioned, prayer meeting's been awesome lately. It's always great, but uh, the last few weeks we've been looking at uh, a video series by Dennis Walker. And I'd never heard him before, but uh, 
I've really been blessed and impressed by this guy. He comes out of the South American revival and his headquarters are now in Las Vegas, but he travels all over the world, speaks to congregations all over the planet, largely charismatic congregations. And one of the things he was saying Tuesday night was that when he speaks to these congregations, he likes to typically ask them the question, how many of you are sure that you have heard God's voice? I, I might just throw that out here. How many of you are sure that you've heard God's voice? Any hands? Got a few. All right. Um, and he says when he asks that question, he usually gets a, a very small response. Very few people raise their hand. So then he follows it up. How many of you hear God's voice all the time? And even fewer hands go up. Then he asks the question, how many of you have been born again? And every hand in the place goes up, typically. He says, we've got a real problem here. Because John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice. If you've been born again, you hear his voice. So what's with this huge contradiction between people who all say they're born again, but are very reticent to say that they hear God's voice? Um, again, Jesus says, what's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. It's one way or the other. Something is either born of the flesh, or it's born of the spirit. It can't be both. It can't be a mixture of both. And one of the questions Dennis asked Tuesday night was, um, how many of you are born of the flesh? And uh, everyone pretty much raised their hand except one lady. Um, but he didn't ask the question, how many of you have been born of the flesh? If he asked that question, then we should all raise our hands, because I think all of us have been, have been born of the flesh. But once we are born of the spirit, we are no longer born of the flesh in the kingdom of God. That's very interesting because when we're born of the spirit, scripture tells us, the flesh is dead. The old man is dead. The sinful nature is dead. It has been crucified, Romans 6.6. 6. It's no longer alive. It's no longer in control. We're no longer spiritual schizophrenics fighting with ourselves. If we're having problems, it's not because we're in a fight with ourselves. It's not because our sinful nature is dominating us. It's because we're believing the lies of the enemy. If we're having problems, that's why we're having problems as born again people of God. Not because our sinful nature is controlling us or monopolizing us. It's because we're believing and partnering with lies of the enemy. Now, if you ask the question, why did so few people in these charismatic churches raise their hands, it's very impressive to me that we have 94% who say they've had an encounter with God in our congregation. That, that's awesome. But we, we have to ask, why did so few people raise their hands, especially in charismatic churches? And I think there are probably one of two reasons. Uh, fear of what other people might think, you know, people don't want to be, seem like they're holier than thou, uh, so there, there's this approval of man thing going on, uh, which tends to be a big issue for most people. Or they were really mistaking this question to mean, have you heard the audible voice of God? And I really liked what he said about the audible voice of God. Uh, he said, you know, I, I've really pressed in with the Lord and, and asked him, why have I never heard your audible voice? And he said, the Lord impressed me very clearly that I save that voice for people who are virtually spiritually deaf. I only yell when people are just about completely spiritually deaf. That's when I use the audible voice. I use the audible voice for Moses at the burning bush because the guy's just about spiritually deaf at that point. I use the audible voice for Saul on the Damascus Road because the guy is just about completely spiritually deaf. So it's not really a good sign if God's using the audible voice with us. That means we're really pretty much spiritually deaf. Uh, 
And I've only heard the audible voice of God once, and that was back in the 1980s, and I was pretty much in that place of just about being spiritually deaf and needing that. But that's not the way God typically speaks, and we need to understand that. So we shouldn't have this great longing to hear the audible voice of God. That means we're probably regressing if he's having to yell at us like that. But uh, I, really, I really appreciated what he had to say on this subject because I think uh, a lot of Christians misunderstand this. They think, oh wow, if you've heard the audible voice, you must be like some kind of saint or something. No, it's really the opposite is true. If you're hearing the audible voice, you're like spiritually deaf, basically. And um, so I, I like that clarification. But um, the price of nice, that's what I've entitled the sermon today. And I just swiped that title from a book I read back in the 1970s. It was a best-selling book, and it made a real impression on me. The price of nice. The whole thing was about the tragedy and danger of being a people pleaser. And that book really made an impact on me, because I think by nature I tend to be a people pleaser in many ways. Firstborn, most pastors tend to be people pleasers. Um, you know, I, I, it really convicted me reading that book. And I, I tried to find it on the internet, and it's no longer in print. Uh, there is a book by John Bradshaw who specializes in codependency. You probably have heard of him. And he's entitled one of his books, The Price of Nice. But it's not the book that I'm talking about. But uh, the best book I've read that is in print and that's currently available and that's a fairly new book is um, this book by Lou Priolo. And it's written from a very Christian perspective. He's a pastor and it's called Pleasing People, How Not to Be an Approval Junkie. And this is the book that I took this little test from. So I hope you've had a chance to fill it out. Your score's probably not going to be worse than mine. Mine was in the mid-70s, which isn't anything to be excited about. Uh, and as I say, I've had to struggle with this people-pleasing thing much of my life. But I'm not going to ask you for uh, what your score is, because if you are a people-pleaser, you probably won't raise your hand, because that's one of the things people-pleasers do, is they typically don't own up to stuff. Um, you know, people-pleasers are a lot like addicts of whatever kind of addiction you want to talk about. They tend to be dishonest. And people-pleasing is an addiction. It's an addiction to approval, needing to get the approval of others. And uh, all addictions tend to be connected to dishonesty. I, I deal a lot with gamblers in the UCLA program. And gamblers are notoriously dishonest. Uh, gamblers are always lying to their spouses and their bosses and, you know, doing all kinds of things to kind of cover what's going up, going on in their lives. That's more the rule than the exception. And I had one uh, client a while back who was in such bad shape financially and otherwise that I told him, you really need to get exclusion from all the casinos in this area which for people that are really in bad shape, that means they go in and they self-ban and they're not allowed into the casinos. Uh, the casinos are off limits to them for a year. They can't even walk in without being trespassing. So to my surprise and amazement, he agreed to do that. And he went and he got exclusion. I said, that's great, you know, that's a huge step. Now we need to uh, focus on developing some of your other interests. And so he said, okay, I'm going to do that. And uh, what he didn't tell me was that one of his other interests was sexual addiction. But uh, anyway, he, he comes back the next week and he's all upset. And I say, what's wrong? He said, I got totally ripped off. You know, I, I went into this bookstore yesterday and they had this big sale table. And uh, it said, books for sale, no returns allowed. And there was this big, huge book with brown paper wrapping on it. And it said, translated, newly translated from the French language. 59 mating positions. And this guy was really excited about getting this book. So he pays 59 bucks for it. And he thinks it's going to be something really great and takes it home, sneaks it into the house, 
doesn't let his wife see it, takes it into his study, opens it up. He says, you won't believe this, doctor, but it was a book about chess, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I grew up playing chess, so I, I couldn't help but laugh. Uh, the whole book was about checkmating positions. And uh, it was just basically ripping people off for 59 bucks. But uh, this guy fell for it. And uh, I guess that's a good example of how you can deceive people without lying. Because that's uh, precisely what was going on in this case. But, um, you know, when we look at the lying spirit, it often attaches to people very young in their family of origin, which leads us to our second point. The lying spirit is often found in marriages and intergenerational family systems. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of jokes about controlling spouses, um, such as, uh, I married Mr. Wright, you know, I just didn't know that his first name was always, that's a, a typical one. Uh, or I haven't spoken to my wife for three months because uh, I hate to interrupt her, you know. Um, but when you talk about um, biblical marriages that have people-pleasing and controlling dynamics, Ahab and uh, Jezebel are one of the prime examples. You know, Ahab uh, is a people-pleaser at heart. He's more of a people-pleaser than he is a God-pleaser. And the primary person that he's trying to please is his controlling wife, Jezebel. She's basically calling the shots, and he's trying to please her. And, um, you know, it makes for interesting drama when you read through the scripture and all the different stories that they're involved with. But, you know, in, in our story today, they've got all these prophets that are people pleasers as well. But... Um, you know, what, what you really see here is that Ahab is not a person who's God-directed. He's not a person who inquires of the Lord. He's not nearly as concerned about what God thinks as about what his wife thinks. And that's a real problem. And, you know, people who, I don't know what you scored on this, but if you scored very low, you know, 50 or lower or something, you might be thinking, oh, no, I'm hopeless. What can God do for me? Um, but the good news is that God can do something for everyone. I, I don't care what our challenge is, what our situation is. Clearly, God can dramatically transform us. You know, and I, I would say he's at least doubled my score over my lifetime. I know there's a time that I would have scored very low on a test like this. But uh, what gives me hope when I look at something like this is to look at the uh, family system of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because if you want to talk about a family system that was contaminated by a lying spirit, uh, by dishonesty, by cheating, by stealing, it was this family system. You know, Abraham lies not once but twice to save his own neck and put his wife at risk. And she goes along with the lie, endangering herself. Uh, Sarah goes right along with that lie. They both lie. Um, and, and that's passed right on to the next generation. Isaac does the exact same thing with his wife, Rebecca, and she goes along with it and she lies as well. And um, then it gets passed on to the third generation where you've got Jacob who uh, has a father-in-law who's as dishonest as can be and gives him Leah instead of Rachel and he's ticked off so he steals sheep and misbrands them and marks them so he can steal his father-in-law's sheep. And then Rachel comes along and steals the household goods or gods, and she lies about it when they confront her. So you, you've just got this constant chain of lying, stealing, cheating, dishonesty going on generation after generation after generation. But this is the father of the faithful, you know? This is the founding families of Judaism, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's amazing what God can do even with our imperfection and our weakness as human beings. Uh, Abraham ends up being a great champion of faith uh, in spite of his inclinations towards the lying spirit and this kind of thing. So, um, you know, 
There's no end to what God can do. There's no question about that. And um, this gives me hope because uh, in, in the family system I grew up in, my dad was very controlling and my mom tended to be a people pleaser. And I just love my mom. I think she's one of the neatest people in the world, very nurturing and loving. But, you know, I can still remember as a little kid, she'd go out and go shopping and she'd hide the clothes and stuff she bought and wouldn't let my dad see them because he was very controlling about money and uh, they didn't have a lot of it. And she just didn't want to deal with the conflict of him finding these clothes and stuff. And I, I'm, I took more after her personality. I really tend to be more of a nurturer and a uh, people pleaser by nature. So I learned very early how to hide stuff from my dad and not let him know what was going on and try to get away and sneak away with things. And of course, it would really tick him off when he found out. But uh, he saw the same trait in me that he saw in my mom. And, uh, you know, that would be very frustrating for him. But, but it's a very typical dynamic in families. Uh, very often you'll have one spouse that's more dominating, more controlling, and the other that's more passive aggressive, more nurturing, more of a people pleaser. And how to get this sorted out and worked out. And, uh, you know, my wife and I have had the same challenges. You know, I, I was more of a nurturer, and I think she'd often get frustrated with... Uh, her having to be the bad guy more with the kids. And me, I would play with them more and nurture them more. And you know, you hear my daughter get up here and talk about how my dad played with me for hours and plays with the grandkids. But you know, the downside of that is the, the adults say, hey, you know, you need to be harder. You need to be stricter. And uh, you know, it really is a challenge that um, finding a good combination, finding a balance with these kinds of things is very important. But I mentioned earlier that pastors in general tend to be uh, really inclined towards being people pleasers. Uh, uh, an unusually high percentage of pastors are firstborns, which firstborns tend to be much more people pleasers than others anyway. But then when your pastor's on top of that, you know, that tends to accentuate that, which leads us to our third and final point. The lying spirit is particularly common and powerful in churches and religious communities. As we just noted, Judaism was birthed in three generations of the lying spirit. The lying spirit was all over that. And you see that throughout the history of Judaism. Uh, you have the Pharisees who become the great heroes. And uh, who were the Pharisees? They were people pleasers. They were people who were more concerned about what people thought of them than they were about what God thought of them. And uh, they were always trying to impress people at the expense of not pleasing God. And um, so, you know, the Pharisees just kind of personified this dishonesty and, and not being God-pleasers. And when we look at uh, our own history, those of us who grew up Adventists, there's a lot of dishonesty in that history. There, there's a lot of this people-pleasing, lying spirit stuff going on. And, you know, it's one thing to have that going on. It's another thing to not even admit it. That was the Pharisees' biggest problem. They wouldn't even own their problems. That's the problem with the Laodicean church. It won't own the fact that it's got these problems. It, think it, has, it claims it has it all together, when it's poor, wretched, miserable, and naked. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. That's why Jesus lashed out at them. If we struggle with people pleasing, it's very important that we're honest and open about that. Yes, I struggle with this. I need help with this. This is a natural area of temptation for me. One reason I have a spiritual partner who's not a people pleaser is because uh, I know this is an area that I need help with, and, and he'll help me. You know, I, I'm guessing Bob scores in the 96 to 100 area on this scale. Uh, I, I just don't see, did you? Well, 97, all right. I predicted it, you know. He's, he's not a people pleaser. I won't tell you what it says in there about if, what he may be, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm very thankful that he's not a people pleaser and that he can be of help to me in our spiritual partnership in this area. But um, 
again, back to Adventism, we, we see how this movement was birthed by people who went through a great disappointment and they were trying to make sense of it and it didn't make a whole lot of sense. So they kind of lashed out at the people that were honest and said, well, you're lost for eternity. That was the first stage of the shut door. Anyone who did not hold to the 1844 message as being valid was lost for eternity. And, um, you know, basically uh, the, the whole thing evolved or devolved, if you will, to several years later, I've mentioned this before, people wanted to join the movement and they said, what can we do? Uh, you know, these people are lost for eternity according to our theology. And so they had to change the shut door to say, well, it's not just those who didn't accept, it's, those who, it's only those who actually rejected the message that are lost. If you heard the message and you rejected it, then you're lost for eternity. But uh, these people that never heard it, they can still be saved if they join the movement. And then the third stage ended up being the um, whole, I, you know, that, that became ridiculous too after a while. So they went to the investigative judgment and the sanctuary doctrine and Jesus going from one compartment to another in 1844 and all this stuff, which again isn't biblical and doesn't make sense either. But it, there had to be some kind of explanation for this. And, and the other documents were destroyed. Those publications were actually destroyed uh, you, you have to be almost a church historian to get access to those documents and uh, know what actually transpired during those early years. And uh, that's not a good thing. You know, the spirit of dishonesty, this lying spirit takes a toll on a people. And, and I think that's one reason that there was so much problem with Ellen White and her writings and her borrowings and all this kind of stuff because the church can't be, become open and honest about that either. The more you cover up, the more you have to cover up. And it, it just becomes, you know, a problem. It's like Lincoln said, you don't have to have a good memory if you don't tell lies, but if you do tell lies, you better have a good memory. But, um, you know, basically group dynamics play a very powerful role with the lying spirit. If people are going to believe a lie, they want to be around other people that will believe a lie. And um, that's what we see with studies on conformity, studies on compliance. Um, we see that group dynamics play a very powerful role, and especially if authority figures are involved. You know, when you look at Milgram studies, which I've talked about, an authority figure tells a student to electrocute someone to death, and they do it because the authority figure told them to. And, um, you know, we've talked about how uh, churches functioned under Nazi Germany, including the Adventist church, which was really the last one. It never did stand up against Hitler. Uh, we've talked about how Adventism, um, under totalitarian regimes, has historically not stood up to these regimes. It's gone along with the authority. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of studies that say, even if it's not involving an authority figure, just the peer pressure of other people seeing things a certain way will cause human nature to go along with that. Solomon Ash had his studies where he, uh, you know, had seven confederates, as we call them in psychology, seven people that were part of the study, and then the eighth person was the one being tested. And he asked these seven people, you know, which line matches the line on the left in size? And every single one of them gave the wrong answer. They all said three. Anyone with normal eyesight can clearly see it's two. But after seven people all gave the wrong answer, 74% of the time, the eighth person gave the wrong answer. Just showing that how strong peer pressure is. People go against their own senses just because of peer pressure, just because of conformity and compliance with other people's views. I'm sure you've heard of the bystander effect, uh, where people will not do anything uh, just because there's a, numerous people. If there's only one person and something happens, they're much more likely to get involved. But if it's numerous people, you know, uh, Kathy Genovese is the most uh, famous example of that, where she was being beaten and raped 
right in an apartment complex with many, many people watching, not only did no one go down there and get involved, but no one even called the police. You know, and, and it's not exactly positive how many there were, but it was a, at least 12 and possibly as high as 38 that witnessed this. Not one person called the police. That's, if you want to go online, just look under the bystander effect and read the 10 top cases of it. They're pretty amazing. It's some pretty unbelievable stuff. But, um, you know, it's difficult to go against the grain for us as human beings. I've uh, met it, just run into two of my former colleagues at the university in the last two weeks, and uh, they both asked me what I'm doing, what I'm up to, and uh, the one person that I told uh, is still working for the university, and he said, you know, I agree with you 100%, but I, I can't attend the church because I want to keep my job, you know. He was just straight out <laughs> honest about it. <laughs> You know, he was admitting to uh, being a people pleaser and a job keeper and all that. But at least he was being honest about it. But the other person, uh, when he asked me, you know, he said, well, you know, you make good points, but the bottom line is just look at the fruits of this church. You know, we've got nearly 17 million people now. Look at all these hospitals and schools and institutions all over the world. Doesn't that prove by the fruit that we're right, that God has blessed us. And I said, well, you know, the only problem with that is the Mormons can claim the same thing. Uh, the Mormons have just about the same church membership, maybe a little bit less, but they've got institutions, they've got a more famous university. Are, are you also willing to say that they must be right and that God's blessed them because they have the same numbers? Or what about the fastest growing religion right now, Islam? You know, 1.4 billion growing like mad around the world. They must really be right. And they must really have the blessing of God, because after all, look at the way they're growing. And uh, he didn't quite want to go along with that thinking. But um, it's just interesting. I, I still get this free magazine called Adventist World. And maybe you got this this last week, uh, the beginning of the movement. And I, this is the anniversary of... Uh, 1863, so uh, I couldn't help but uh, read through it. And it was just fascinating to me that there was no mention of any of the controversies, any of the problems, nothing that happened there. It was all just, we're 17 million strong, God's blessed us, we're obviously the remnant, we're the true church, because look what God's done, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, you know, you have enough people saying that around you, and, and it's easy for people to believe it. But, um, you know, the bottom line is that all we can do is try to be informed. Um, if you want to read an interesting book on Mormonism, uh, Fawn Brody's book, No Man Knows My History, is a fascinating classic work on Joseph Smith. If you really want to see what the founder of this movement was like, read that book. Uh, all we can do is try to read honest appraisals of the founders of these kinds of movements. And that doesn't make them, that doesn't mean God isn't doing things. There's a lot of great Mormon people out there. Uh, the church does an amazing amount of good stuff. And the same is true with Adventism. But it's also true that, uh, you know, movements are often built on house of cards. And the kingdom of God is not built on a house of cards. The kingdom of God is built on Jesus Christ, and he is truth. He's not a lie. He's not functioning by the lying spirit. Uh, he's straightforward and true in everything he does, and that's who we want to be as his people, without being you know, judgmental or hateful towards people who are different from us. But I close with the story of a man who came into work, and he was amazed to see that his business partner was wearing a diamond earring in one ear. You know, he'd been working with this guy for more than 20 years, and he always wore a conservative business suit. He never wanted to attract any kind of attention to himself. So he said, hey, what's the deal? What's with the earring? The guy said, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. But the business partner just couldn't let it go. So when they were eating lunch later that day, he said, you've got to tell me what's going on with this earring. And the guy said, 
okay, whatever, I can see you're not going to let me rest till I do. Uh, I started wearing it when my wife found it in the passenger seat of my truck, you know. <laughs> yeah. He had good reason for wearing it, I guess. But uh, the bottom line is, uh, if you don't live a lie, then you don't have to be bound by telling lies. If you don't live a lie, then you don't have to be bound by telling lies. As we've seen this morning, there are many different expensive routes of being a people pleaser. My prayer for all of us is that we will not be guilty of giving in to the lying spirit because none of us can truly afford the price of nice. Thank you.